What's up, everyone? This is Bob Don with the Levy City Podcast. Each episode, I interview people that are doing grassroots work in their communities. This episode, I have the privilege to interview Jordan Verdeen. He's a world-class portrait photographer, and he's the founder of Humanity Showers. And over the last few years, he's become a good friend of mine. I actually met him when the pandemic started. I was, all my travel stopped, and I was looking for an opportunity to serve locally. And somebody mentioned him and the work that he was doing. And I went down to Humanity Showers and actually got to see his work firsthand. And from that point on, I've gotten to spend a lot of time with him and learn just about all of the work that he's doing, all the things he's been learning as he's been spending time with people on the streets. So thank you for spending time with me, man, and doing this interview. Well, thanks for having me. First thing I want to dive into is your photography. I'm fascinated by um, kind of how you ended up doing what you're doing, but take us all the way back to when your photography journey started. Yeah. So I actually became a photographer in 2018 and I've, I never really had any kind of formal education or experience, but at the time my sister worked at a local newspaper in a town called Fallbrook and she, she said, Hey, they're hiring a, a photographer. If she's like, if you come, I can help you get the job. And like, I had, I didn't even own a camera at the time. So I went out and bought a camera and I went on the first assignment and they, they liked what I did. And that's really how my photography journey really started was from that photo journalist standpoint. And I think that like the first three years of me doing photography, I did it from a storytelling standpoint which is going out and interviewing people and talking to people and taking their pictures. And so I feel like that played a big role in my photography in the way that I do do it overall, because I was doing it from a connection standpoint. And what uh, type of camera were you using? At that point, I was using a Canon 50D, which is like a very s- simple camera. And uh, to be honest, for like the first four or five years, I shot the camera completely on automatic settings because I had no idea how to use the camera. <laughs> and same with editing, like same editing, with editing. I wouldn't even basic. edit my pictures. I would just hope for the best. Shoot, I would shoot like spray shoot, just shoot a lot, and hopefully one or two of those pictures would come out good. So, how did you end up getting to the point where you're interviewing people on the street? So, I always say like the camera for me has always been a, a tool, like a, a bridge, a point where something that allows me to connect with others. And I had growing up going on mission trips and I had been doing work like that overseas and I I wanted to do something different locally here in my community. And so what I I started doing was just interviewing people on the streets, just having conversations first without my camera, just talking to them. And then as that grew, I, I slowly implemented my camera and then I started interviewing people on the streets in Oceanside in 2014. And when you look back on when you started doing those interviews, is there, do you remember the very first one that you did? Like, what was the process of you actually, because a lot of people are intimidated to go up to people on the street. Yeah. What was the journey of you actually finding someone on the street and having the courage to like talk with them and be civil enough to be able to actually take their photo and have a conversation with them? Well, it's kind of funny because I would always walk around with the camera on my neck and it would always be the person that was on the other side experiencing homelessness that I would always initiate the conversation. They would always say like, Hey man, nice camera. Or like, wow, you're a photographer. And then I would just kind of like roll in that method and be like, yeah, I'm a photographer. And then like, they'd ask like, what kind of pictures do you like to take? And I say, well, I, to be honest, I like taking street portraits, people, pictures of people on the street. I was like, let me show you real quick. Watch, look over here really quick, snap a picture, snap one or two shots and then show them the photo. And they'd always be all impressed and they'd be like, Hey, tag me on Facebook or send it to me, you know, on Instagram or, and so that's kind of like how that really initiated. It was always very organic. And then at what point did you actually start interviewing people? In 2014 was the first time that I actually started interviewing people with a a purpose behind it. So you were already taking portraits and you did that for a while. Yeah, I did that for a while. And then what was the deciding factor of, I'm going to start actually recording or telling these stories uh, of these people? So 
There's something called implicit bias, which is the bias that we as people harbor against other people unconsciously. And a lot of times people harbor unconscious bias towards the homeless community or towards other people. And that just means like when you see a person, automatically you think something about them, whether it's good or bad. And so what I wanted to do through photography was challenge implicit bias. And so I was having these conversations with people on the streets, which were completely shifting my paradigm and shifting my thought process of the way that I saw people on the streets and what led them to becoming homeless. But then what was happening was that I was going and having conversations with other people and they weren't having the same experiences I was. So it was, that's where I realized the need for me to start sharing stories so that it could start shifting the consciousness of people surrounded by me as well, not just myself. And that's when in 2014, I launched that campaign just to start interviewing people, sharing stories, hopefully that it could shift people's perception. And when you say campaign, like, did you have a goal of how many stories that you wanted to do? So initially I was like, I'm going to interview 500 people. I thought that was like a good amount because I I felt like that would be enough to really formulate like an understanding of what led people to becoming homeless and I surpassed 500 stories. I'm about 800 stories right now. And so like my new goal is a thousand, but I'm pretty sure it'll extend beyond that. I remember you telling me that you studied, was it peace building yeah. in school? Talk a little bit about that and how it was connected to stories. Cause I think that that's, that's been a big part of your journey. Initially when I started this photo project too, it wasn't like X amount of number per week. Sometimes it would be one person a week, two people a month. It was a very slow um, process. It wasn't very methodical or, or thought out very well. But in, when I went to school, I went to school for negotiation, conflict resolution, and peace building. And when I was studying my peace building courses, they talked about how storytelling was a main facet for building peace and allowing people from two opposite sides of the spectrum to come together. And that's when I decided to really use photography as a mode and as a method and more not necessarily photography but more the storytelling aspect of it to build peace and to help people to see the commonalities in us all so you're interviewing people take us back to like a story that really stands out like what was a moment where you're like this is really powerful and how far into the 500 was that particular relationship to be honest it was actually probably one of the first stories that I ever did. His name was actually Bob and he was a Vietnam veteran. He had his master's degree and he was working on his dissertation for his PhD, but he served on the USS Midway and and suffered a post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as battle fatigue at that time. And so due to that, he um, battled heavily with addiction and mental health, but it was through that story and learning about that person that it really shifted me when I was saying, man, most of the time when you see someone on the streets, you wouldn't think that it could be someone that served our country or that's working on his PhD or that's so accomplished. When you are able to have these conversations, it really just challenges what you think of when you think of someone who's homeless. And that was one of my first stories ever um, that really shifted And did you guys maintain a relationship from there? Yeah. So that was in 2014. And that was my first time ever really engaging with someone on a weekly basis. So I engaged with him every single week for the next year. And I walked with him the whole process of getting his ID, getting his birth certificate, helping him apply for benefits until I was able to help him get off the streets. And so he was the first person that I ever did that with. And what was that process like of actually? helping someone get off the streets because you're basically building a relationship with them. You're helping them with all these things. Did you like help them get into an apartment or what was that kind of process? Yeah, I helped them get into an apartment. And to be honest, um, Bob was one of the first people to that really kind of cemented this idea of the importance of dignity because it was in November 10th, 2014, the first time I met him. I remember it clear as day. Um, It was actually my birthday and um, I took him out to lunch and we were coming up on Thanksgiving time. And then I told him, I was like, Hey, um, would like to have you over for Thanksgiving. But before then I was like, maybe we could take you. I took him to a hotel to, he got a shower, got him some clothes, got him a haircut, got him all cleaned up. 
And then when he, I brought him to our Thanksgiving dinner, he interacted in a completely different way. He was interacting as Bob, the person who had his master's degree and was working on his dissertation. He was no longer the homeless Bob. Mm. And so and then that's when I saw the power of what treating a person with dignity can do. Mm. And where did he end up? Like, what did, what's his, what so was his story from there? on May 22nd, he actually, once he was in his place. May he, 22nd, 2019? No, 20, this would be like 2015. Oh, okay. A year, later, a year later, he um, actually ended up passing away due to liver disease. Mm. Um, just because of his, they were saying that it could have been attributed to Agent Orange and also his alcoholism. Mm. But, so he ended up passing away. His family flew out from Colorado. They didn't even know that he was homeless. They had they had no idea where he was at. So I was able to meet his son, Bill, and we were able to connect. And it was just kind of a real cool, holistic story. But So then in 2015, after he passed away, I actually launched in the initial GoFundMe link to build the shower trailer. And that shower trailer was originally going to be called Bob's Bus. Like, I think if you find the... Hmm. That was like the original idea behind it. Because I was like, oh, what we'll do is... I spent over a year with Bob and I was like, I don't think that I can dedicate that amount of time to everybody. But I was like, there was that initial interaction, which was the shower, the haircut, the clothes that really transformed the way that he interacted in society. And I was like, I think we can replicate that on a mass scale. Mm. And so that's when I launched that GoFundMe. So was it somewhere in your relationship with Bob or was it through a consistent series of the interviews that actually sparked the inspiration that you want to start providing showers to people? It was initially with Bob and through, throughout my relationship with Bob, I continued to interview people and I was constantly confronted with the fact that people didn't have a place to shower overall, at least in North County, San Diego. In other places, it's more accessible, but here in North County, San Diego, there was lack of access to showers. And I had interviewed probably over a hundred people and they kept expressing the two top needs, which one was the lack of being clean and two, the lack of being seen. Mm. And that was consistent through the majority of them. Consistent. I mean, and even if you, the cool thing about Instagram, you can scroll down all the way to 2014 and you can actually see Bob's story. But if you start going through the stories, I ask everyone a set of questions and I would always ask people, what, what do you need? And they kept saying, a place to be clean, a place to be clean. I was finding people with um, missing hands, missing legs, infections. And, and I was like, what, what is this attributed to? And they just kept expressing that it was the lack of access of being able to clean themselves and their wounds that was affecting them so deeply. I love like startup stories and kind of how things get sparked and kind of the journey to actually get to the point of actually doing an idea. I always say like, it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to actually pursue it. Yeah. Most people have really good ideas and, and very few people actually act on it. Yeah. What was kind of the process of going from, okay, I'm hearing that people need to be seen, which you're helping with through the photography and the yeah. storytelling and people want to be clean. They yeah. want showers. What was the process of you going, okay, people are consistently wanting to be clean. They want showers and starting to act on that. What were some of your next steps from there? So for me, now this is 2015. I'm living here now in Fallbrook, California, and I'm going to community college here in Oceanside. And so on a weekly basis, what I'm still doing is connecting with people and interviewing people. But what I started doing was I started creating like my own little hygiene packs. I would take either like wet wipes and little snacks. And then from there that it kind of grew into, it would be called like jerry cans or like kind of look like big gas tanks, but they're filled with water and we would go around washing people's hands and feet and just kind of continually interviewing people and trying to have people understand what a need showers were. But at the point, um, Nobody really took me serious because I had zero experience and zero understanding in nonprofit world. So I launched this GoFundMe in 2014 slash 15. And it wasn't even until 2019, almost five years later, that I raised even, I think it was about $14,000. And then I, I needed to initially raise $20,000 to build our first shower trailer. So I ended up just taking those $14,000 and actually building our first shower trailer versus buying one because I couldn't afford to buy one. 
So it, so it took four years yeah. to just raise 14,000. You needed 20,000. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't get the rest. So you ended up saving costs and just building the shower yeah. trailer by in- yourself. Instead of buying one. Because I was trying to buy one. It was like, but people, it was just trying to convince people like, look, here, here's a story. Here's mm. another story. But they're like, what experience do you have in nonprofits? People had such a hard time giving me the money because I, I don't think they didn't think that I was going to either fulfill with what I was doing or I didn't know what I was talking about. So then I just took that money that we had and we built our first two stall shower trailer. Then in 2019, late 2018, early 2019, we launched our first two stall shower trailer. That's so wild. Yeah. Um, and where'd you launch it at? Like, how did you decide, <laughs> okay, now we have the trailer, we have yeah. showers, we're about to provide showers to people. Where did you decide the location? So I, I chose a, a church parking lot uh, and that's the same church parking lot that we use on Wednesdays right now. Um, 208 South Clementine um, in Oceanside, California. And it was a church that was kind of a couple blocks away from a transit station where I knew based off of my experience of interviewing people that people like to hang out at. But at that moment, there was no real shower trailers in the area. So like even the concept was sort of foreign even to people experiencing homelessness. Because I would say like, hey, um, do you want to come take a shower? And you know, they're like, who's this random kid like coming up to me asking me if I want to go take a shower? I'm like, yeah, I have a trailer right up the street and you can take a shower in it. And people were always like really weirded out by it. So initially, like I would be like driving around trying to find anyone to come and bring them to take a shower. So I would like pick them up, bring them in my car. And for like the first few months, maybe like only like four to five people would go to take a shower. And so that was, that was a fun experience. And what was their experience? Like after they did shower, did you have some positive interactions? Oh, like yeah. people were like blown away by like, well, cause they were like, Oh my God, this is the, so <laughs> since I built the shower, we built it more like a home style. Like we made it feel very homey versus the traditional shower trailers, which are very sterile overall and very small and confined. So ours was built a lot different. And so anytime anyone would step in there, they would be like, I felt like I was at my home. I felt like, this was, it reminded me of before I was homeless and, and, and we would get them and they would be like, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get so-and-so. And they would go and get their friends and, and bring them. And so then that's kind of like where things really started to shift overall. So after starting doing the showers and, and connecting with people and they're starting to experience it, what was kind of the next step after that, as far as like more and more people just started finding out word of mouth? Well, so, and then, so this whole time, I mean, I'm working, I'm going to school, that I'm doing this. They're doing portraits. Doing portraits. I'm working. Uh, I'm going to school. I was going to school in LA at the moment, at, at Cal State Dominguez Hills in LA. So I was commuting from Oceanside to LA uh, two to three times a week. And so we were only doing showers when we started once a month, every last Friday of the month, just once a month. And so, but then from when people started saying like, man, this would be great if we could do it more often. So then I was like, okay, well, maybe we could do it every other Friday. So we started doing it every other Friday and then we just moved it to every Friday. And then now we do it five, six days a week. And why mobile? Like, why did you decide to go the mobile route? When I'm thinking showers, I don't know if my first thought would have been, let's do it in a trailer. Why did you decide to go the trailer and mobile route? I thought it was cool just because it was like a cost effective way to be able to take showers to multiple locations and, and also to bringing showers to where people were, because originally my thought and idea was that I would just bring showers along with me when I'm doing stories and talking to people and hanging out. And it's like, Hey, people could shower while I'm doing what I'm doing. And so it was never to create like some type of organization or some fixed location. It was just always to be just going with me where I am. Why the name Humanity Showers? So that name actually originated from the first person to ever take a shower in our first two-stall shower trailer, Brett Strong. And it was funny because he took a shower the first time in Fallbrook. So I put the shower trailer in Fallbrook and I set up, set up all the clothes, set up food, and nobody came. Like not one homeless person came or one person experiencing homelessness came. And then I did it again, another event and no one came again. And I was just like, okay, man, like I thought people wanted to shower. So then like what I did was like, I got a van and I went to Oceanside and I went to find some people that wanted to take a shower. So I found Brett Strong and Daniel Lattis, um, the first and second person to take a shower. I'm like, Hey, you guys want to go take a shower? They're like, 
uh, okay. I'm like, I have a trailer in Fallbrook because I didn't even, <laughs> and so I, I picked them up in Oceanside and drove them to Fallbrook wow. where I had clothes, barber, food. And, and so that got them in and they, they, like, they like, felt like they won the lottery. Yeah. Like, they were what like, is this? Just like, so this was before, like it was viral to do those types of things, yeah, you know, yeah. just kind of doing it and pick them up. And so Brett took a shower in the shower trailer. And after he came out, I'm like, I always ask everyone, like, how do you feel? What do you think? And he was like, I feel human again. It's the first time that I felt human in a long time. Mm. And since showers weren't available in Oceanside, it was very common at that time, 2018, 19, to find people that had gone two to three months without showering, sometimes mm. even longer. And at that time, it had been over three months since Brett had taken a shower. And so then it became kind of like a routine, like every, I would pick them up on Sunday mornings. Every Sunday morning, I would pick them up, take them to Fallbrook, take a shower, and then it started growing. Like I first, I had like a seven passenger van and I would fill that van up. And then I moved into a 15 passenger van and I have photos and all that stuff too. Like it would be calling it like field trips. So I'd come to Oceanside Transit Center and I would fill up the van with a bunch of people experiencing homelessness. I would get there like at six in the morning and they would be waiting there with their bags and stuff. And they would all just load into the van. I would drive them to Fallbrook and everybody would go take a shower. And this is before the Wednesdays. This was before Wednesdays and even before the Fridays. It's like this, the beta test. This You're was like, the beta is test. This, yeah. is that, like people are saying they want showers. So yeah. are they willing to actually? So at first you started commuting everybody. Yeah. Driving everyone to the showers <laughs> and like, so we'd all take a shower and then some, then we'd go to church and then we'd all go out to eat. It was like, like the, I would call it the magic school bus, which was like my <laughs> yeah. little bus would like pull up to the transit station. I'm like, all right, whoever wants to shower. And then people, other homeless that were in the area were always like, man, what's going on? They're like, oh, he picks us up and takes <laughs> us to shower. And they're like, what? You know? And so like, that's initially how we started because I didn't really have any kind of organizational direction is what I wanted to do. I just knew that. I wanted to provide showers and the parking lot in Fallbrook, what was at my local church was the only parking lot that was available to me at the time. And so that's why I was like, I used what was available to me, just happened to be far away. People in Fallbrook who were experiencing homelessness didn't want to go to shower. So I was like, well, fine, I'll just go pick people up and bring them. Mm. And so that's literally how that started. So that's how the name humanity showers came was I always ask people, I'm like, Hey, what do you think? How do you feel? And they're always like, man, I feel human again. I feel mm. human again. And and just kept being reset and reset. And then we we're like, well, we can call it human showers, but we didn't want people to like um, confuse what we were trying to say. So we're like, well, if we just add ITY, humanity showers has a better ring than human showers did. And so that's where the name came from directly from the community themselves. What I love about Humanity Showers is it's pretty much built from the ground up by the people who are ultimately experiencing the showers themselves and the community. So let's dive in a little bit to that. So you guys are meeting, and now you guys are meeting at multiple locations. Yeah. Um, but what I love about what you guys have going on and why I love every time I get to come down, there's a community at this point. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the community because it's different. It's like, I always joke, like you guys got music playing. Yeah. I'm like, you guys got uh, clothes there now, food being served. And I'm like, damn, this is outside Nordstrom. Like it's got a full on experience. You step <laughs> in and it, yeah, everyone is just pumped and positive. And um, talk a little bit about the community of how that's kind of built into uh, and what you've curated. So for me, that is all components of what dignity is. Because a lot of times people think dignity is just a shower or a clean pair of clothes. But to me, dignity is design. And a lot of times I personally would go and volunteer at different organizations. And I was always impacted, not necessarily in the best way, but how sterile these environments were to help people. And, and then I knew like when, I, if I ever had the opportunity to create a space to help people heal, that I would want to design that place in a different way with people in mind in a, in a guess an environment that would be healing. And so for me, that's when I decided like, well, we need to bring in arts. We need to bring in music. We need to bring in things that you wouldn't traditionally see in places that serve the homeless community. And so like to me, intentional design is dignity to me, creating things that, that maybe you don't think the homeless necessarily deserve, 
I think those are the types of things that I like to bring in. Like we have a chiropractor that comes into our space, massage therapist, people creating craft coffee. You know, we have barbers, but not just any, we don't get student barbers. Mm -hmm. Like it would be yeah, like my, barber. my actual barber, yeah. Bob's barber actually goes to these events. So it's like, cause the common sentiment that we were finding was that, well, if you're homeless, whatever you get is good enough. It's better because it's better than what you had. But for me, like the, the standard has always been, if I won't eat it, if I won't wear it, if I won't use it, then neither should the people that were offering it to have to use it. Mm. So it's like implemented that even my own self, like I've, I eat the meals that we serve. I wear the clothes that we hand out. I pick, I've got a lot of clothes from the outreach. I um, cut my hair where they get, get their haircuts. I use the soap that we provide at the showers. And I actually sh have showered multiple times in the trailers that we offer mm -hmm. to really understand and to really cement the idea that what we have is good enough, not just for the people we serve, but for society in general. I started going to these different outreaches and you would see people go and volunteer and serve meals and they would never sit and have community and eat meals with the people. Most of the time they'll serve meals and they'll leave and go eat somewhere else after, or they'll serve coffee, but then they'll go have their craft coffee in the car. You know, they'll give out certain items, but they would never be items that they would personally use themselves. And so for me, I knew that that's what I wanted to shift was the culture of giving what is considered good enough for people. Mm. Yeah, well, it's cool is when I'm down there, like it's actually hard to decipher who's uh, not homeless versus who's homeless um, because everyone's looks the same. <laughs> everyone's like decked out in great clothes. Everyone's got their hair cut, you know, like I look more homeless when I go down than, than a lot of these people who just got a fresh shower and they're looking fresh. And so, yeah, something that we, we've done too is that the homeless community has always wanted to be a part of the solution, a part of the community, but rarely anywhere you go, are they even allowed to, Hey, don't pass this line. Hey, don't come over here. Stay over there. You're there only to be on the receiving end, never the giving end. So when I created our space, I said, anyone that wants to be a part of even the leadership of whatever we're doing, if you're homeless, even more so, we want you to be a part of our team. So our organization is 100% volunteer, but the only there we have about six people who receive a daily compensation and all six of those people are all experiencing homelessness at this time. So we have them, they, they help us at the hygiene tent. They help us at the food tent. They help us clean the trailers. They help in the setup. They help in the teardown. Like right now it's Saturday and we have showers going on this morning and it's ran a hundred percent this morning. The showers are ran by the homeless community. There's not one person who's housed that ran today's event, Wow, which is really cool. Like Mike, Mama Cat, Mark, we're all running the showers today at Brother mm. Benno's foundation and they're all homeless right now. And there's no volunteer coordinator or anything like that who isn't homeless that's helping them. And they run that shower every Saturday by themselves. That's so powerful. Now, it kind of answers my next question, but I know that there could be some people listening that learn about your work, providing showers, haircuts, like cream of the crop treatment, yeah. right? What do you say to the people that might ask the question, are you just enabling something? Are you, are you stalling something out? Are you allowing, are you setting these people up to continue to be homeless rather than ultimately try to get them off the streets? I, I really enjoy when people ask me that question because I think it provides a space for a good conversation. And I always ask people, if you had the opportunity just to take a shower and meal and haircut just one time a week, would that motivate you, you, you yourself mm -hmm. to stay on the street, to endure the elements and to be outside and go through the trauma that people go through? Would that three hours of solace motivate you to stay on the streets. And a lot of the times most people will say no. And what mm -hmm. I, what I feel like what we're doing is enabling people to be in a state, to make a difference, 
to make a difference. And what I'm saying is to be in a space psychologically to want to change, to want to be better or different. And so that's what I think is what we do. We enable people to make change. Mm. But that's beautifully said. Well, with the people that are now serving, share about a couple of people that have been consistently coming. Like they're kind of like the all stars that are there every week. They're helping out. Um, they, they're just characters, man. They're so, so funny. They're loving. They're so welcoming. Um, share about a couple of those folks. Yeah. You know, um, one of my favorite people, um, her name's mama cat. I mean, even her name, mama cat is so what we've tried to be strategic in people that we, I guess, employ or have be a part of our community. And so it's like, she's a mother. So she does a great role at being a mom to the community, to providing showers. And then we have um, Javier, he's our GM, you know, and he used to work at McDonald's and he was like a, a general manager there. And so then he got to be a manager now at showers and it's just been fun a fun experience overall, you know, currently right now we we're providing showers about six days a week all all throughout San Diego County and month on a monthly basis, we provide showers in Orange County and Los Angeles County. Wow. What's your goal? Like what, when you think long-term with humanity showers, you know, what are you kind of, what what are your thoughts when you look into the future? Well, realistically, the goal, it's just kind of like a a weird goal, but it would be that humanity showers no longer has the need to exist in terms of that we've been able to address the underlying issue of lack of access to showers. And so like, and it maybe that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to build shower trailers, but maybe we can work with more of these institutional organizations to influence them to buy shower trailers, to build shower trailers and them to start carrying some of this work uh, or to influence some local governments and cities for them to fund these shower trailers and they fulfill that work. So overall our goal is for showers to no longer be a necessity. Yeah. I love your mindset in it too. Like you actually have already inspired other, um, more institutional nonprofits here in San Diego. Yeah. San Diego Rescue Mission started a, a homeless shower after having some of their folks come and work with you for a season. Yeah. So what we what we're trying to do now is we find like with the rescue mission, we piloted a program with them for ten months where we came to the organization and showed them how to do showers. And after that, they said that they were ready to do showers on their own. And now we're at another institutional organization right now, Brother Benos, and we're providing showers with them. And we're hoping that we can hopefully either help them get their own shower trailer or some type of help them improve their shower facilities. And so our overall goal isn't to expand and become this multi million dollar nonprofit, but it is to just either inspire and educate people to do what we're doing, but where they're at and it in a local level versus us just coming over and trying to take over, I guess. Yeah, I love it. You're trying to fulfill the mission rather than trying to build an empire. And I've always respected that about you. Like you're very collaborative in your approach and you're very like, there's a job to get done here. And I don't really care how we get it done. But like, let's all kind of come together and try to figure out what the most effective strategy is. What I love about you is you seem like you hold everything really, really loosely. Yeah. When people start something, it becomes their baby and they like try to, they want to nurture it and make it this big thing. You don't come across like that with humanity showers and even the portraits. Like you have a very loose grip on everything that you're a part of. Why is that? I think it's really due to... I've, so I spent a lot of time volunteering and working with different organizations and nonprofits. And I've seen that my dad always told me this. He said, marry the mission, not the model. And so like for me, like my mission has always been help people be impactful, be intentional. And not necessarily my mission isn't build showers on trailers. Showers on trailers is a model that's effective now but it won't necessarily be effective 
five years from now, 10 years from now. And so I feel like that's what happens with a lot of nonprofits and organizations is they set out originally to be impactful with their mission and model. And their mission stays true, but what's unfortunate is most of the time their model has also stayed true since the implementation of maybe 80 to 100 years ago. And I feel like that's what's lacking in from people being able to be effective is the innovation of not their mission, but their model. And so for me, I've always just become very fluid with the way that I do things. Like we did, um, before we did shower trailers, we did um, wet wipes and we innovated or evolved into using buckets. And then we evolved into using two stall shower trailers. And then we evolved into using six stall shower trailers. And even right now we're looking at ways on how we can evolve the shower trailer model and already move away from that. So I think it's just like, and this is just in the span of five years. It's not 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I think we need to be the way that technology and the rest of the world is continually evolving and innovating. Most sectors that are helping people in that are experiencing homelessness are the least innovative and the least willing to receive change. Yeah. Yeah. I always, like I've been saying, it's becoming a common theme in my life right now is like leaders need to be asking the question, what is the most effective strategy? Yeah. That's going to keep us innovative. It's going to keep us moving forward and it's going to keep us from becoming stuck in models that are no longer working. Yeah. What is the most effective strategy? And I feel like you ask that a lot um, in your journey. I mean, and not to undermine too, like you have built something pretty big at this point. Like you have an insane amount of volunteers. You're yeah. Like you said, you have a couple of people that are getting paid. Those are the people that are experiencing homelessness. But you have done an extraordinary amount with very little. Yeah. How many volunteers do you guys have? So we have, I don't know, we have probably over 100 volunteers, to be honest. So you got about 100 yeah. volunteers. You have how many sh- shower trailers? We have five shower trailers. Five shower trailers. How many locations? Um, Maybe like eight locations. Eight locations. And you're doing all of that on what type of a, a budget? And so people probably most likely won't believe me, but it, we're probably doing it on around $2,500 a month budget. Yeah, that yeah. logically does not make <laughs> sense. Um, and so, which means that that, that 2500 bucks is like, that's not something that even can cover a personal salary. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, we've been able to make some pretty cool partnerships with local corporates like Dr. Bronner's, which is a soap company that supports us. We're they pull our trailers. They they literally have their employees um, with their company trucks pull our trailers around and deliver them to all these different locations. So that's a huge cost. That's that's like absorbed by them that they help us. And something unique about us is that we've never applied for any type of because what we're what I'm what I'm trying to do overall is shift the language and the narrative surrounding homelessness at least within my own community, people will always express how homelessness is such a cost to society or an expense. And so strategically, we we have not received one grant or one type of aid from any type of agency. All of our donations, all of our money have come from people, everyday people like me and like you on a local level. So all of our work is funded by people that willing fully give. So it's not, none, nothing that we do costs society anything. It's not taken away from arts. And so like, that's just something that I've really, really wanted to do. We've had multiple nonprofits and multiple foundations that have approached me and asked me, Hey, will you please fill out our grant? And I was like, I won't fill out your grant. I'm like, if you want to help us, you can help us, but I'm not going to fill out a grant or. Yeah. It's a fascinating case study. How many people do you guys serve on average, like every month? So we're serving over a thousand people a month right now. So you're serving a thousand people a month with a $2,500 budget. Yeah. And I just think it's a fascinating case study because you have a lot of organizations right now that yeah. are millions and millions of dollars in budget yeah. and they're not serving that amount of people. So I think there's something to everyone who's listening right now. There's something to pay attention to with Jordan's story and what he's doing because you don't have to have a lot to do a lot. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot we can learn from a political standpoint, from a corporate standpoint, and from a community standpoint 
in being able to create innovative ideas that are going to cost less and do more. And as leaders, we need to be asking the question, what is the most effective strategy? I think I have a kind of like a cool story and it comes from the Bible and it's in John 6. I'm not sure if the person that's listening to this um, has a religious background or not. And it's okay if you don't, but just the 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 questions that are asked in the story are relatable to a lot of things. And so Jesus said just, he got to the Mount and there was over 5,000 people that were following him and they sat there and they were hungry and the disciples came up to Jesus and they said, um, Hey, Jesus, the people are hungry. And then Jesus, Jesus asked Philip a question. He said, where can we get food to buy for these people? That was the question he asked. And Philip responded, not with an answer to that question. He responded with a question about cost. He said, it would cost way too much to feed all these people just even one bite. You know, so like that's, a, and then what happened was then someone else said, hey, there's a boy here that has uh, two fish and five loaves. And I feel like in that story where I am is the boy with two fish and five loaves. And society says right now, homelessness, like what is the answer to homelessness and local governments, nonprofits, people are all saying it costs so much to mm-hmm. be able to help. There's, there's way no, too many people. There's way too many people. Mm-hmm. There's nothing we can do. But yet there's the little boy that comes in and says, hey, I have two fish, five loaves. And so what Jesus does is he takes those two fish, five loaves and feeds 5,000 people till they were full. And not only did every single person get full, but there was over 12 baskets left over of extra. And because so, the food multiplied as they started passing yeah, it out. And so like he just, it was like this miracle. And so, and so that's the way that I see myself because it's not like, there's no way that I know that I could be doing the work that I'm doing, but like when you put it in the right hands and it's able to not only fulfill the need, like we are in Oceanside, they say there's only documented three to 500 people experiencing homelessness, but yet we're providing over a thousand showers a month. So that means almost every single person experiencing homelessness in Oceanside is taking a shower at our shower trailer. You know, and so like not only are we meeting that need to three to five hundred, but we're exceeding it on a two fish and five loaves budget. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, and what I love about that too is that a lot of people want to be the Philip or they want to be the Jesus in the story, the miracle workers. And we have too many people trying to be the miracle workers, and we need more people being the young boy that has uh two fish and five loaves and who's willing to give that up. Yeah. to experience just, uh, just what you have at your hands available. Cause a lot of times it's come common sentiment, even with people when they approach me about the work that I'm doing, they would say, Hey, if, if I had your capability to take portraits, I'd be doing what you're doing. If I had a shower trailer, the way you do, I'd be doing what you were doing. And I always contrast that and ask them, well, what are you doing? right now. And most of the time they'll be like, well, I'm not, I'm not really doing anything yet. And so I'm always like, well, to be honest, I don't think you would be doing that because we initially, like I shared before, we started with our two fish, which was wipies. We started with water buckets. We always worked with what was at our disposal now, not like what we'll eventually have. And I feel like a lot of people and and not just in this nonprofit sector, but just in multiple areas of their life are kind of stunted by what they think that what they have available right now isn't enough, but it is. Thank you for sharing that, man. That's that's some good stuff. To finish out, last question is why local? Like for you, why local? Why do you feel like it's important to to pursue the work that you're doing on a local level? So my parents have just helped me a lot and the way they speak to me, like my dad always said that like, if you build a strong home, you can build a strong community, which then allows you to build a strong society. So like I have a local model, but I know that if we're impactful locally, we can be um, impactful more on a County basis, which then can allow us to be impactful on a national basis. So I'm starting local 
because I know like if I can build a strong foundation in helping people around me, that will be able to extend to help people on a bigger level. That's amazing, man. Well, thank you for spending time with me. I always enjoy our conversations. I always learn something new every single time that we connect. If you want to check out Jordan's work, his portraits and his stories, visit his Instagram at Jordan Verdine. It's V-E-R-D-I-N. And if you want to learn more about Humanity Showers, you can visit humanityshowers.org. And you can check out Humanity Showers Instagram at Humanity Showers. So inspired, man by the things that you're learning and so inspired by the grassroots approach that you've taken. So thank you for spending time. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Love Your City podcast. If you want to find ways to get involved in your community, you can visit loveyourcity.org. If you have any questions or recommendations of grassroots leaders or nonprofits that we should be aware of, email us at media at loveyourcity.org.